G'day folks and welcome back to Giving What We Can, where we explore how to use our resources to do the most good. In this episode, I'm joined by Sean Mabry, the CEO of Strong Minds. Strong Minds is a non-profit organization that is working to improve the mental health of people in low-income countries. Since founding in 2014, they've provided group talk therapy to more than 180,000 women and adolescents in Uganda and Zambia. In this episode, Sean provides an overview of the importance of mental health, the scale of the problem in low-income countries, and what we can do to help. So without further ado, here's Sean Maybury. My name is Sean Maybury. I'm the CEO and founder of Strong Minds. Strong Minds, our mission is to improve the mental health of women of all ages in Africa. And we do that by focusing on depression, which is the number one mental illness, the leading cause of disability. There is more than 66 million women suffering from depression in Africa. And according to the World Health Organization, more than 85% of them had, have no access to care. So our job is to help these women to overcome their depressive symptoms and to become depression free and mentally strong. Since 2013, we've treated nearly 175,000 women in Uganda and Zambia. Had a pretty interesting journey to get to where you are now and when you started Strong Minds. It'd be great to hear a little bit about your career and how it led to founding Strong Minds. Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to share. Yeah, it, I, I'd like to think that there was a great plan behind the scenes, but like so many of us in life, you kind of just go down certain decisions, doors open, you walk through them, and sometimes you're glad and sometimes you're less glad. Um, I started in my 20s uh, working for the United States government as a, a diplomat, a foreign service officer, as we call it here, worked in embassies uh, in Europe and in Africa, in Kenya and Somalia. I uh, did that for about eight years. Uh, went back to graduate school, uh, Emory University in Atlanta. I got to get a bit of plug. Um, and then moved into the, the high tech sector, working for Intel, uh, making microprocessors. So a natural progression from diplomacy <laughs> to, to microprocessor technology. Uh, did that in Oregon, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, and China for a number of years. But it was, you know, my, my earlier days in Africa with the State Department really kind of. Uh, uh, piqued my interest. I really just saw, particularly in Somalia, as you can imagine, I was there in the 1990s during one of their that the famine at the time. Uh, just how difficult life was there, and I just thought to myself, you know, working for a a for profit company, that you know, where do I want to spend my time in my life? How do I want to make a difference? Do I want to help a company's stock price increase, or do I want to help people live better lives? Um, so after Intel, and I loved being at Intel, I learned so many great skills that I use today. Um, after that, uh, I started working for larger NGOs, population services, became a country director in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also the, the Republic of Congo. I did both countries, because uh, one Congo is not enough. I uh, did that for about five years, tremendously rewarding, uh, focusing on malaria, HIV, sexual reproductive health. I moved over to India for a number of years. Um, and then uh, ultimately uh, came to, to Strong Minds, uh, just leveraging my own um, passion for mental health, uh, and maybe we'll get to that later, just where I come from in terms of my experiences with depression, uh, and just understanding that, you know, focusing on mental health, launching a depression intervention in Africa would have such a, a huge impact. I, I, I didn't want to duplicate efforts in Africa. I, I always joke about, you know, uh, there, there's so many NGOs in Africa that are duplicating efforts that if one ended, you wouldn't you wouldn't really see their their absence. And I didn't want to. I don't want to spend my time duplicating efforts. So that's how uh, we got to Strong Minds and, and Mental Health in 2013. It'd be great if you can share some of that experience uh, that you had that led you to focus on depression specifically. Sure. No, I'm happy to. Um, you know, yeah, we've treated nearly 175,000 women with depression. Yet I have never had depression myself. Uh, I'm not a, a super jolly guy, but I've just never had the, 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 the actual diagnosis or the screening for depression. Um, but I grew up in a, in, a, in a somewhat poor family in, in the United States, in Massachusetts. Both my parents uh, suffered from severe depression. You know, as a kid growing up, that's just normal. That's what you expect. Your parents are less engaged uh, just because they're suffering. They're suffering with the symptoms of depression. They can't focus, anxiety, fatigue, um, and so for me, it was normal to have parents who were somewhat less less engaged than, say, my friend's parents. Um, and then as, as an adult now, I, I'm, I'm blessed with a, a beautiful wife and, and four children. We still have depression in my house now. So I, I've always had a front row seat to depression. I understand on the receiving end what depression does to maybe children, what it does to parents, what it does to, to families and friends. Um, so I'm passionate about 
solving depression uh, for individuals and reducing those symptoms and helping people to become, we use the term at Strong Minds, depression free. It's more of a, a lay friendly term um, and helping them to become mentally strong. So when uh, in 2013, um, the universe aligned and I stumbled across a New York Times article uh, talking about a randomized control trial and RCT to test a type of group talk therapy in Uganda that was successful. That RCT was done in 2002, and I'm reading the article in 2013, and it was wildly successful, and it looked like such a, an effective way to treat depression, uh, you know, by the, the group approach. And, you know, and it really just galvanized me, leveraging my background and experience being part of depression, and then my own experience in Africa, where I had seen in my time there from uh, the State Department to the, the development sector, my African friends, neighbors, colleagues who had suffered from mental health, yet there was nothing we could do to help them. All I could offer was a condom or a mosquito net. Uh, and that was hugely uh, frustrating because there's, there's such little mental health uh, training amongst uh, medical professionals in Africa. It, it practically doesn't exist. So when I saw that article in the Times, it started coming together in my mind that we could address depression simply in a group model, effective, cost-effective, reach more people, hit depression, the number one mental illness, something that I understood uh, in a place where it was needed in Africa. So it felt like it was just, you know, the gods from above reaching out and saying, Sean, you must do this. So, yeah. And yeah, it had been at that point 11 years since that RCT. Why do you think uh, no one else had acted on that? Oh, that is one of my pet peeves. Uh, it's a shame, really, from 2002, uh, I found out in tw uh, 2013. Um, I have since become friends with the lead researcher on the RCT. He's an Australian guy uh, here in the United States. Um, he's thrilled with what we're doing. I, I, I'm convinced that there are great solutions on the RCT shelves that we just need to mine. I joke kind of with black humor that, you know, I, I'm sure an RCT has found the cure for cancer and they forgot to tell the whole world. Um, I've heard of, I can't remember, but I've heard of some other organizations that kind of mine through, mine, M-I-N-E, mine through RCTs and try to find great solutions. Um, because in our case, you know, a lot of um, enterprises, social entrepreneurs who start up organizations, they have this great idea and they want to make it happen. For me at Strong Minds, I didn't have the idea. We were totally using someone else's thinking. For, and, and us, it's not the great idea. It's, we're just great at uh, implementing and operationalizing and making it so. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's some great RCT research out there that uh, that we should really try to uncover more, but that's uh, maybe a, a second hobby. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the scale of the problem of mental illness in low and middle income countries? It's really huge. You know, when you think about it, uh, if, if we just focus in Africa, at least with, uh, I mentioned some of the numbers earlier, at least 66 million uh, women suffering from depression, 85% no access. I, I'm sorry, but I would have to say that the 85% is generous. I would say it's more like 99.9% .9 of those women have no access to care. Uh, and also we know that 66 million number is something that Strong Minds calculates and we calculate it very conservatively just to make sure we don't want to over kind of hype the problem, if you will. Uh, the number is probably closer to 100 million when you really think about it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a, a lack of resources, a lack of investment. When you think of a Ministry of Health in any African country with a very limited budget and a very huge portfolio of needs they have to address, um, they don't have the resources to really train mental health professionals. And up until recently, um, you know, it was pretty much mental health can only be delivered by trained psychologists, psychiatrists, or trained doctors and nurses. And so there was kind of a, an access problem. You had to go th to the clinic. You know, now more recently, like with the WHO talking about task shifting, which is about how do you democratize mental health? How do you get a neighbor trained in mental health to treat his or her neighbor? Um, that's one way to, to reach more people. Um, but that's a more recent development. So you have ministries of health in African countries that just simply don't have the resources for it. And then externally, you just see just a, a lack, uh, such a stark lack of funding for mental health from outside, you know, from, from Western countries, you know, providing uh, development aid. Um, you know, in the last 10 years, the number I saw total 
of all health aid going to Africa, the amount for mental health was less than 1%. Uh, so it's really not funded. So there's no money coming from outside. There's not very much money available inside. So how do you really address mental health care if there's, there's almost no resources there? And then throw in all the additional complicating factors like the stigma around mental health, you know, where many people would love to just ignore it and not talk about it and focus elsewhere. So there's a lot of... Um, uh, challenges uh, geared up against good mental health, particularly in Africa. Now, some people might think that uh, the cause of uh, mental health um, issues in places where they are already kind of low income and experience a lot of health issues might be some of those things that you're already working on, uh, like some of the health issues. Uh, can you speak to the causes of depression and, um, and what they actually are in, in these places? Yeah, that's a very common misunderstanding that, well, the, the, the misunderstanding being that poverty causes depression, uh, that poverty, com you know, causes just dissatisfaction. On the depression side, poverty does not cause depression. Uh, it certainly can add to it and exacerbate it, uh, but it's not the sole cause alone. You know, we work in, in the slums, uh, say Kampala and Lusaka, very large slums, where everyone is poor, everyone is living in poverty. Yeah only not only but about 25 percent of the the women in those slums are typically will up to 25 percent will suffer from depression now if poverty was causing depression i would ask well why isn't it closer to 100 percent? why are there 75 percent of the women who are mentally healthy and not depressed um the, the same you could use that same argument when you think of uh the upper west side in new york city right which is typically a quite affluent area in the united states why is depression exist there uh yet there are endless psychologists there providing their services to people suffering from depression um you know so so poverty can help make depression more difficult when you think about the modality we use in our group talk therapy at Strong Minds, it really comes down to identifying certain triggers of depression that are common. If you kind of ask why enough times, you'll come down to uh, one of those triggers is uh, disagreements. Now, if you're a, a man and wife living in the slums, you're going to have more disagreements over, say, how do you spend the $2 that you've made that day, you know, in the choice on school fees or, or uh, food for your children, and, and the husband may want to have some entertainment using that money, for example. So there's disagreements that can come from that, that poverty as well. Um, but poverty alone, if you solve poverty, you don't solve mental health. And, and that's, that's such an important message that we at Song Minds are just trying to help people understand that the connection and the interrelation. Can you speak a little bit more about how Strong Minds treatment model works? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we use what's called Group Interpersonal Psychotherapy, IPTG. We always have to have an acronym. Uh, it was created in, uh, in New York in, in the 1970s. Um, you know, the, the RCT I mentioned was, was based on using IPTG in Uganda. It was the first successful taste, uh, test of any psychotherapy uh, to successfully treat depression in Africa. Um, it really comes down to, in, in the, the IPTG approach, the common triggers of depression, as I mentioned. So if you keep working with someone to help them understand, there's common triggers like disagreements, social isolation, life change, for example. And it helps people to identify their triggers. And the triggers are always interpersonal. They're how I react to, uh, with you, for example, Luke. It's not about what's happening in your head, but it, which would be more internal, but it's more externally. How are you interacting with friends, neighbors, uh, children, for example. Uh, and then it's helping individuals to see what the triggers of depression are for you, and then coming up with strategies in, in a group setting to reduce those triggers. Think of the triggers as a dial. As you turn the dial back, then depression uh, dials back. So in all of our groups, it, it's not about a strong minds uh, staff member or a volunteer you know, standing at a lecture and telling everybody, this is what you should do. It's more of just our facilitation of helping uh, depression sufferers to identify their triggers with our guidance and then for them to come up with uh, plans. You know, I could help suggest to you, Luke, what can you do to reduce the disagreement you're having with your wife? Or, or there's a life change. You've just moved to Kampala from a rural setting. You're really overwhelmed by the urban setting. What can you do differently based on my experience? So it's coming up with strategies to reduce the triggers, which reduces depression. And throughout all of that, it's helping individuals to understand that depression is something that you can manage, that has triggers, that when certain things happen, uh, the trigger can increase and depression can increase, or 
the trigger can decrease and depression decreases. So it's giving the individuals the control over depression based on the strategies that they can implement around their triggers. Uh, it gives them the control and it takes away, at least in Africa, kind of the mystery around what is depression, where is it coming from? And it helps people to understand that, yeah, you can influence depression uh, and take the control back. Um, and, you know, we see uh, right now our groups average about eight weeks and we see um, consistently uh, over these uh, nine years, roughly about 75 percent of the people in our group are uh, no longer depressed, what we call depression free. That's down to like zero to four in our diagnostic scale that runs from zero to 27. Can you, you tell a little bit? Uh, tell us a little bit more about the diagnostic scale and um, how you're using that to decide or understand the progress that people are making. Yeah, happy to. You know, one of the I think one of our core strengths at, at Strongwise is just uh, is our data focus, uh, our data obsession. Uh, everything has to be numeric. We have to understand what's happening. We have to have the data and the facts behind it. So for us, it's uh, there's a lot of different diagnostic tools to to screen for depression. Globally, there's nine recognized symptoms for depression. If you went online and, and typed in, am I depressed, you're probably going to get nine questions. It, it's not by accident. Uh, the tool that we use is called the Patient Health Questionnaire, PHQ-9. Uh, nine. There's nine questions. And, and it's really uh, just helping to ask, um, are you feeling these certain symptoms at what severity over the last two weeks? You add up the score, 0 to 27. 27 is, is, is you know, maximally depressed. Uh, and, and there's a spectrum there from mild depression to moderate, moderately severe, severe. Uh, and for us in our groups, uh, we rely on that tool so much. Uh, before someone comes in a group, we're using that tool at least twice to kind of double check. Uh, during the group, we'll do another three times, kind of beginning, middle, and end. And after the group, we'll do it another separate time with kind of independent observers who are eliminating certain biases. And so when you think of all the uh, hundred and nearly 75,000 women we've treated and all the data that we have on them, all their PHQ-9 scores, it's been really in, informative. And it's so important because at least using the U.S. Uh, example of our mental health care system here, only um, less than 20% of U.S. mental health professionals actually do any measurement in depression on a patient, which is just shocking to us, you know, because sometimes we'll get challenged, oh, how can you implement mental health well on the ground in Africa using volunteers, et cetera. But yet when you look at the, the Western side, I'm like, well, actually, I would argue we're doing better. You know, and it, it's interesting, right? Like if you went to a doctor and he or she diagnosed you with high blood pressure and put you on medicine and a regimen, but yet never measured your blood pressure, you'd probably say, wait a minute, there's something not connected here. But yet you could go into a psychologist and she's going to diagnose you with uh, depression, but yet she's never screened and never run the tool by you. Sometimes we, we listen too much to medical professionals, um, but I, I kind of go off point. The, the point being, we're, we use data to understand depression, to, to screen it, to diagnose it, and to track it. Uh, to help us understand, are we making a difference? And that kind of feedback loop we have helps us to modify the program, make it better, and to continuously iterate it. Um, so that today, you know, we're doing eight weeks of intervention. In 2014, we were doing 16 weeks of intervention. We've cut it in half. We've cut the cost down of cost per patient from uh, almost $400 originally down to, un right now we're under $100 just from using tools and data uh, and this diagnostic tool to make us better. So you mentioned before about the approaches that you use to remove bias from measurement. Can you unpack that a little bit and share it? Like, what are those approaches? Yeah, we had found uh, just so many learnings over the nine years, right? In the early days in 14, we were getting depression-free numbers out of our groups that were just like in the 90s, 90 percentiles. And we were just like, you know, that is just too good to be true. That can't be the case. What's going on? And as we dug deeper and did more research and kind of looked around, we realized what was happening was... Um, when the groups ended, uh, we would then do a final a diagnostic on group members uh, to see how they were feeling. And because during the group, the uh, the depression sufferers had formed uh, you know a very close bond with the Strong Minds facilitator, uh, we realized that they were inflating how they felt while well, reducing their score, but inflating the fact that they're healthier as kind of reward to the facilitator. Uh, helping that person is, it falls in the bucket of a, a social desirability uh, bias. You're doing what the, the social constructs around you kind of expect. 
when we then stopped having the facilitator administer the final tool and brought in an independent person, no strong mind shirt, no bond to the graduates or the sufferers, um, we, we saw the depression scores drop by, by about 10 points, 10 percentage points. Uh, and now we just we stick by that. Any final score for us has to be done by an independent uh, external observer just because of the bias. And it's interesting. We've always been meaning to write the paper to, to kind of, you know, posit that social desirability bias in Uganda equals about 10 points. That's what it is uh, as like a rule of thumb. And there are rules of thumbs like that for certain things, like the adjustment factor for social desirability bias for certain factors. It may go back to that whole thing why the RCT sat on the shelf for 10 years. Sometimes we don't get around to doing certain things. But anyways, I just realized that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you've talked about the, you know, obviously the benefits um, to the patients of being depression free is you know, great in and of itself. Um, can you share a little bit about the indirect benefits? Yeah, the indirect benefits are so important as well. Uh, you know, our mantra at Strong Minds is that when an African mom is no longer depressed, her entire family thrives. And for us, it's just important to, to prove that. And, and we collect all of the data, not just all of the data on depression, but we work to understand how has the, the mom who's no longer depressed, uh, how has her life improved? How has the life of her children improved? And we, we uh, consistently collect and see the data that when moms are no longer depressed, their productivity increases, uh, nutrition in the home increases, attendance of their children at school increases, um, their whole connectivity, uh, their whole social connections increase as well, which is always very important. And so for us, there's been lots of research in the West over the years that kind of shows when you're not depressed, you, you're, you kind of um, flourish. And we're, we're showing the same in Africa. Um, and for us, that's so heartening because when I think of depression as, as say, a, a lever, the magnitude of what becoming depression-free generates, it's not just good mental health. It's the changes. You know, your kids go to school more and there's better nutrition in the house because you become a more uh, a more involved mother who can you know, make the meals, for example. Your physical health also improves when you're not depressed. You know, a lot of risk factors drop. Um, so when you think about that, uh, kind of moving the depression-free lever in the middle, uh, the results are, uh, it's, to me, seemingly endless when you compare it to, say, other interventions, perhaps like clean water or, or something else. So there's a huge impact from good mental health. On a related question, uh, why is it that Strong Minds has focused on women in particular? There's a number of reasons I, I wanted to point out because I don't think I've been clear yet. Uh, you know, we we're, we work with women, uh, and in the early days we had general population. You know, the general age of women we were treating back in 14, 15 it was about 35 years. Over time, we've expanded that. Now we work with refugees in Uganda as well, which is uh, there's such a need there as you can imagine. Refugees, with how the life events that they've gone through, and now we're working with adolescents down to age 12 as well. So there's a broad spectrum. But in general, um, you know, we focus on women because depression affects women at twice the rate of men. Um, so if you had, on average, a room of 100 depressed individuals, about you know two-thirds of them are going to be uh, women. If we had all of the resources in the world, uh, you know, we would treat women and men equally. Uh, we don't have all the resources in the world. We have the you know, mental health funding is very limited, as we mentioned earlier. So for us, we feel it's just so important. We absolutely have to maximize the investments we make, philanthropic investments, the return on those investments. And so for us, it's if we can treat women, uh, they're more in need and there's a greater social kind of output uh, of helping those individuals. I would love to see the day that there is enough funding that we don't have to make that choice uh, between individuals. Now, like on the adolescent side, we do treat uh, boys and girls equally because uh, being in school, you can't separate or isolate. Uh, and, and so there are there is a growing number of males we're treating. If you did a pie chart, about 20% now of our annual treatment uh, is male so it is increasing i would like to uh, if you could share some of the other evidence uh, that has come out recently from the happier lives institute and also maybe some of the work done earlier by founders pledge and kind of your response to that yeah no thank you for letting me do that uh yeah we're, we've been so excited this, this year uh with the happier lives institute with their recent report that uh, compared us to give directly and compared our mental health interventions our group talk therapy and compared us to direct cash transfers uh, and a lot of analysis that they've done, and they've kind of gone back and forth and revised it. But ultimately, they came out with the um, the observation that our impact on the mental health side on our groups 
is nine times as effective as a cash transfer, uh, which is really uh, interesting for us. You know, given the fact that we collect all the data and show the social impact, it doesn't surprise us. But having that external validation who's gone through all of the data uh, and kind of revised the analysis, at first they came back, they were up around 12 uh, times more, and they've kind of made some, some uh, changes to the thinking, but we're still at nine. And for us, um, you know, it's not a competition between us and Give Directly. They do fantastic work. I, I've seen their work firsthand in Uganda, for example. We used to work very closely with them in, in the Strong Minds groups. Um, but it's more just just giving more credibility to the mental health side, helping um, people who might be standing on the sidelines trying to decide should they fund mental health to see that it is a substantial return on investment. Um, now, some people may make the personal choice that mental health is not an area they want to invest in. Uh, I'm talking about philanthropists or maybe something else. Totally respect that. But I think just giving the credibility and, and the potential impact, um, helping people to understand that it is so great. Like I was talking about that that lever. So the 9X for me supports my, my lever kind of uh, um, thesis. Um, and so it's, it's really great news from Happier Lives. We're really excited. Because, um, you know, it, it's difficult working on mental health. Um, creating the awareness to stakeholders, philanthropists, government officials who make the decisions. All this research that comes out are, are incremental efforts and more light we're shining on the corner for people to understand why good mental health is a good investment. So we're really excited about that. It would be great if you could share about how your previous experiences working in HIV, AIDS and malaria helped inform the way you deliver programs for Strong Minds. Yeah, you know, coming to Strong Minds, you know, the way we operate Strong Minds, the, the data focus, uh, one of our values is to think big and act fast. We go super fast like a startup, even though we're in nine years, we don't spend a lot of time. We just move, move, move. Uh, a lot of that, for example, comes from my, my time at, at Intel in the high technology sector, which, you know, is somewhat revered for being a little bit cutthroat. Uh, and it was, but it also allowed me to just hone and develop a number of management skills that I that are in my DNA today. That, and I'm so grateful for them because, you know, those that ability to be bottom line focused, get things done, move quickly, uh, just make decisions, um, being flexible, all those great kind of management kind of, uh, you know, words. Uh, it is what we've been able to infuse at Strong Minds. And then when I look at, say, my time in the Congo, you know, almost five years there, uh, somewhat in the middle of the war in, in the 2000s, you know, we moved, I think it was about like 10 million mosquito nets across that country, um, <laughs> a lot in canoes on the Congo River, not a lot of roads in the Congo back then. Um, but just the ability to get things done and to work well uh, w with teams and understanding it has to be team oriented uh, and, you know, focused on scale. I think just being in the Congo, such a giant country, right, it's the size of Western Europe uh, and getting things done there and making a difference just really just enthused me and just inspired me uh, that, you know, working with great teams, you can make a big difference. Um, so yeah, today at Strong Minds, there's a little bit of Intel, there's a little bit of, you know, Congo, other stuff in there, sprinkle in some diplomacy. Uh, I think maybe some of my colleagues may be hard pressed or maybe surprised that I used to be a diplomat because I can be a little assertive. Uh, but you know, we, but we bring all those stories with us. Uh, you know, our, our life is a bunch of stories. So yeah, so that's, that's some of the background. Given the scale of mental health and like, it's quite well known, the disease burden that you know, it, there is globally. Why do you think it's still such a often overlooked important issue? Ah, there's a number of reasons. Uh, it's such an important question because, you know, as we look, we have audacious vision uh, at Strong Minds. We want to end the depression epidemic. It's not just about Africa. We want to end it the world. We feel like we have a very simple solution to depression and that it's our responsibility to not let it sit on a shelf and to get it out and to cover the world. Um, there's a lot of reasons. I think a lot of it comes down to stigma. It's just a lot of people still are uncomfortable talking about mental health. Um, just the fact that we talk about mental health, right? We don't talk about physical health. On the physical side, we talk about heart disease or cancer or something. But in mental health, we, we bunch together hundreds of illnesses under some vague topic of mental health. And, and I do the same. Um, there's, a lot of, there's still a lot of stigma there. People are uncomfortable talking about it. I, I see certain foundations we approach for funding and they're like, we do not fund mental health. Like, okay, I mean, just that categorically, almost very assertively. So when you think about it, I mean, these are some big organizations who just choose to not fund hundreds of, of illnesses that have a huge toll. And a lot of it comes from stigma. Um, and th thus, because of it, you know, there, there's little funding there. Now, 
when you look at say like there has been recent increase on the awareness of mental health uh, thanks uh, to the pandemic. We're not really though seeing that convert into dollars, um, but we want to hopefully get there. And I think maybe another reason too is um, there's not a strong global mental health movement. It's very fragmented, some small players here and there, but we're part of global mental health at Strong Minds. We, we don't have one unified strong voice and that's something that strong minds it plans to be working on in the coming years is how do we defragmentize global mental health how do we bring all the players together start sharing knowledge start lobbying for more funding and really speak with one large megaphone megaphonic voice if you will and we think that can make a big difference because we know we can't do it ourselves but we know we're stronger when we're part of a larger collective for example Fortunately, you've been able to start really scaling over the last few years. And I'm assuming that's come with increased funding. Where have you seen that come from, that increased interest? I think we've just gotten better as an organization in terms of funding. How do we communicate to individuals? Um, you know, we've seen our funding increase um, thanks to a number of you know, philanthropic partners, small, medium-sized foundations, some bilateral funding. Uh, a growing portion has been uh, just from individuals. Uh, I think um, one of the advantages on mental health side is almost if you have a room of 100 people, almost every one, every one of those 100 have had some impact from mental health or mental illness, be it themselves or a loved one, which isn't the case if you're uh, thinking about malaria or HIV, that the number of the people in the room would be much less. So in that sense, it's funding mental health, good mental health is relevant to almost everybody. And so we've been able to start finding a lot more individuals who believe in our mission and fund it. And then I think too, when you look at the recent scaling um, that's been going on, a lot of that is driven through partnerships, working with a lot of NGO partners in Uganda and Zambia. We just launched in Kenya two weeks ago, working with an NGO partner in Mombasa and closer relationships with the Ministry of Health, where in Uganda we're partnering now uh, with over 1,000 community health workers who are running groups. And, you know, anytime you have 1,000 people doing something, it, things start getting big really fast. Uh, and, and luckily, uh, we're seeing that generate into more patients treated and, and more, more lives improved. What do you think some of the biggest challenges are to implementing effective mental health interventions globally? Wow. Um, well, certainly the funding is. I think the whole defragmentation of the industry is so important because there's lots of things. It almost goes back, there's a theme today, it almost goes back to that RCT on the shelves, right? If there's a mental health organization, let's say in Ivory Coast, who has a good approach on group talk therapy to do something, I don't know they exist. So I'm going to have to recreate the wheel to come up with their solution. And we saw that, for example, we had to redevelop our group talk therapy a couple years ago to treat adolescents. Mindful that a 15-year-old young girl is very different than a 55-year-old older woman. We weren't aware of anybody on the planet who was doing group talk therapy for adolescents. So we had to redesign, do all the research, the focus groups, the human-centered design work, all of that, a lot of work to create the program. Um, and it's quite uh, effective now. I'm sure, though, there's someone on the planet who had already actually done that. Now, if we had, could have gone to them and said, hey, you know, can we use your program and learn from you? We could have saved two years and a lot of money on that. So if we can defragmentize the, the industry, share more, I think um, we can get smarter and, and then move faster. Um, so for me, that is the biggest challenge. It's the fact that we're, we're not uh, united and presenting a kind of a consistent front, which allows the stigma to continue, allows, you know, we need to shine a bright light on the fact that good mental health has so many um, positive uh, impacts, and we need to make that more just strongly shared and then for, for change to happen. What have you learned about adapting the program to work with beneficiaries from different uh, demographics, such as refugees and adolescents? Yeah, no, you know, working with refugees, for example, is so different from working with 13-year-olds in Kampala uh, down to, to Lusaka. Um, you know, for example, when you think of a 13-year-old adolescent or a 30-year-old uh, uh, young woman, you know, that 13-year-old has a, be it anywhere, be it Kampala or even in New York City, right, that 13-year-old has a much shorter attention span. Uh, they're, they're all glued to their phones. Um, so, like, our groups for adolescents have to be a lot what we call flashier. They have to be a lot more interest kind of uh, evoking, a lot more kind of bells and whistles. We have kind of games. We have cards. We have lots of stuff going on to keep uh, the, the younger uh, depression sufferers uh, engaged. 
uh, when you look at the two groups, an adolescent group looks like there's a lot of activity going on, almost like you're juggling for an hour, versus a group for, say, you know, 30-year-olds, which is a lot more... I don't want to say sedate, but pretty straightforward. Um, and then the same goes like working with refugees, right, who many times will have some comorbidity with, uh, unfortunately, with some trauma or PTSD just because of their experience. And so we have to be mindful of how do we manage trauma in a group uh, of depression um, sufferers, which isn't typically something we have to address in other settings. So yeah, there, there's a lot of kind of uh, adaptations that we've come up with, uh, and it just uh, is an accumulation of learnings after after nine years on the ground. Um, can you also share a little bit about the way that your team is structured? You actually have, um, you're based in the US, but the vast majority of the team are elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, that, that's been an evolution. At the end of last year, we made some really strong mo uh, changes, uh, moved our headquarters to Kampala, Uganda, where it should have been earlier on. It had been in the United States. So now the US office, where I spend a lot of, more of my time, uh, is strictly just a support office. I am spending a lot more time this year going back and forth and spending time on the ground. Um, and, you know, for us, it's just been a natural evolution. You know, we've, we've done such important work and investments in the teams in Uganda and Zambia, and the teams there now are just incredibly strong and so solid and so stable. And that takes time anywhere in the world to build a good team. Uh, I, I think it's even harder in the nonprofit side where you don't have a lot of financial resources to do that team building. Uh, but now the teams in both countries are super strong and we really decided last year that, hey, the, the, the teams are ready to take on this added responsibility and burden of having the headquarters there. Uh, and now, you know, almost a, a year later, no regrets whatsoever. It, it's working incredibly well. You know, the U.S. support office, which is mostly uh, on the fundraising side, continues to do very well. Uh, and we just really enjoy having the headquarters, you know, in Africa because we're an African organization. So it, it's logical and it just took us some time to get there. Sometimes the, the most obvious decisions and choices are right in front of you and sometimes you don't see them right away. So given the success of group talk therapy programs in Africa, why do you think this is still so rare in places like Australia and the United States? Oh, man, million-dollar question, right? Um, well, you know, it's funny, right? We're, we're, we're starting to launch our group talk therapy for Strong Minds here in the United States through what we call Strong Minds America. We'll actually be starting those groups in the next couple of weeks in, in Newark, New Jersey. Everybody knows Newark because of the airport. Um, yeah, and it's under the premise or the hypothesis that we can make group talk therapy work well here. Um, there's not a lot of group talk therapy uh, available here in the United States or, I guess, also in Australia. I don't know if it comes from that, that rugged uh, independence that a lot of uh, these Western countries have that, you know, I can manage it myself. But yet when you look at it, particularly just talking in America, we have a lot of uh, successes with group approaches, particularly like on Alcoholics Anonymous, um, uh, which, which, you know, it, it may be subject to debate from d different people, but certainly a lot of impact there, very group-centered. Um, and that's really our goal here is to begin to show that group talk therapy works. It's, it's effective. There's a lot of advantages to it. Yes, we can all be very independently minded, but there's certain advantages to come together uh, and to share in the groups and to learn from, from others, which is... As a side point is, it's interesting, right? Because when you look at depression, the increasing rate of depression globally, uh, and there hasn't been a convincing answer as why is depression increasing. A chemical imbalance in the brain isn't really a cause of depression. That's more of a misunderstanding. Um, but, you know, some of the uh, one hypothesis that I've seen that I tend to agree with is that depression is increasing because of that social isolation. Loneliness is increasing. Um, thereby, for us, it would just be if you followed that premise that, you know, group therapy makes sense because you can connect people, you can reduce loneliness, and that's part of reducing depression. Um, you know, we see that in our groups in Uganda and Zambia, where um, after our groups end, after eight weeks, uh, the last data we saw, 77% of the groups kept meeting after the eight weeks ended because of those bonds that they formed, um, because of the depression sufferers coming together, who are very typically socially isolated, create the bonds, and then they don't want to stop meeting their, their newfound friends. Long-winded story comes back to the fact that, yeah, I really think group therapy has a potential impact. Um, we just have to show that it works. Uh, and that there probably there have been other models with it to show it as well. So it's not a complete, you know, parachute in and see if it works. Looking forward now, what are the main areas of focus for strong minds in the coming years? 
Ah, oh, so many fun focuses, right? Well, uh, continue to scale more. We 175,000. You've heard that number so many times today. It's a good number, but it's really small. 175,000 over 66 million is is like a really small percentage that I don't have the courage to plug into my calculator. We need to reach a lot more people. We can't do it alone. We're not looking to do it on ourselves because we'll never find the right funding to, to become an army. But for us, it's finding the levers of working well with like the Ministry of Health in Uganda and Zambia, working with Ministry of Education in Uganda. Uh, you know, finding NGO partners who want to take up the model and to go forward. You know, just our recent launch in Kenya, working with Trigger Eyes in Mombasa is another great example of how we can find partners to take our model, to take our flag forward into the battle against depression, if you will. Um, so for us in the future, it's how do we continue to grow and to make an impact? And for us, growth is all about just helping people to become depression free because unfortunately we still feel in the space that if we don't do it no one else is going to uh, and we have to find others who are able to do it and make that impact uh, you know we want to end the depression epidemic first in africa and, and then starting in the u.s and, and elsewhere we we fervently believe we have just such a simple effective model uh, that solves depression and it's really our job to kind of get that out globally uh, and to share so what are some of the things that you're most proud of about Strong Minds? Oh, so many things. You know, as, as, as the founder, I'm speaking to you from, from my home in New Jersey. When I started this in 2013, I started it upstairs in my attic, where I'm not sitting right now because it's 100 degrees out and the attic is like 200 degrees. Um, so I was really all by myself for the, almost the first two years. I uh, had a few people around me who really believed in me, particularly my amazing wife. And now, fast forward nine years later, we have almost 200 people, great boards of directors and just advisors. We have such a network and, and family of people who believe in us. And I just, I'm just so proud that we've been able to get the message out and kind of grow the network and the awareness. Uh, and it's never about me. It's more of just how do we reduce depression and, and help people become mentally strong. So I'm just proud about what Strong Minds has been able to do to bring more people together with that passion and to create the change. And I really feel like we're starting a movement at the very smallest step and we'll get bigger and bigger and to make an impact. Um, yeah, we, we all want to make a difference in our lives. So I, I'm super proud of that. I'm, I'm proud of everybody at Strong Minds who chooses to, to, to work for us. You know, I think of our group leaders who run these groups uh, in really difficult situations, you know, in the slums of Kampala, you know, just dropping down in the shade of a tree or, or next to a stream somewhere under shade. I could never do that work. You know, I've never run a group. I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a group talk therapist. Um, but just the fact that they do that day in and day out, that they have this tremendous core and reserve of empathy that they can reach down into and that they choose they choose to give their life energy to strong minds and and we choose to make a difference for others um so i have so much to be proud of but ultimately it always comes down to just the people who have chosen to to give their life energy to to strong minds so i'm so grateful finally what's your 30 second pitch of why you think donors should consider giving to strong minds Strong Minds works to improve the mental health of women in Africa of all ages. We focus on depression, the number one mental illness. And in Africa, more than 66 million women suffer from depression, yet 85% have no access to care. Strong Minds conducts simple and effective talk group talk therapy that helps women to become depression-free over the long term. More than 75% of the women we treat become depression-free. We work under the mantra that when women are depression-free, not only are they healthier, but their entire family thrives, and we have the data to support that. We would love your help to partner with us to help more women to become depression-free. Thank you. Before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share? Oh, man, I think we hit so many things. I don't know if it came out well, but just the fact that today, through all of the people we're treating, it's not just our own staff, but we have over a thousand volunteers, not just community health workers, but just volunteers, women who have graduated from our groups, running groups. So it's really become a small army of people conducting groups from staff employees to CHWs to pure volunteers. And again, like a shout out to them and just to thank them as people on the team. You know, these aren't always staff employees, but there's just an army of people who choose to spend their time helping others become depression free. I wanted to highlight that as we kind of mobilize more people um, that it is, uh, you know, we're building an army, we're building a village to, to help solve depression. And I'm not sure if that had come out clearly. Uh, it is certainly something to celebrate and uh, have a lot of admiration for the team that you have uh, and the people who are putting themselves out there working on this mission. 
Uh, it's been lovely hearing more about Strong Minds, the work you do and where you're headed. Uh, thank you so much for it uh, and uh, look forward to seeing where it all goes. Thank you so much uh, for, your, for your time, Lou. Great to be here today and thank you for everything that uh, Giving What We Can does. It's so important.